This podcast is part of the Planet Broadcasting Network. Visit planetbroadcasting.com for more podcasts from our great mates. Oh, hello. This week's episode is brought to you by ShipStation. Do you sell online? eBay, Amazon, Magneto, Magento, Magento, (laughs) Mother... Then you need ShipStation. I think you got it right. It's not Mother. (laughs) It's the fast and easy way to manage and dispatch your orders, all from one place. You can use ShipStation to compare rates from top couriers, including Royal Mail, FedEx, DHL, and oops, UPS, sorry. And whether you have one or hundreds of orders, ShipStation's, ShipStation makes it easy to batch and print labels so you get orders out quickly and keep your customers happy. No, that's a threatening tone. Yeah, whoa, whoa. whoa. Light, light here, we, spoke, we spoke about light and light, Sorry. <clears throat> And keep your customers happy. There it is. So, yeah, anyway, this episode is in part brought to you by ShipStation. On with the show. <laughs> How was that? Good job. Thank you. No, Dave? Theme song here. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to another week of Do Go On. My name is Dave Warnicky and I'm here with Matt Stewart who's drinking a big glass of water but it has to be in a beer glass and I'm here with Jess Perkins who's uh, drinking a bottle of water and it has to be a bottle glass. Yeah. yeah. They're our demands. Yep, that's my rider. Oh, I don't even have any. I've got nothing. I don't even have a rider. Oh, when you get pretty big in the podcast game like yeah. we are. You get to make a few demands. Oh, who are we making demands to? To demand? Water. Yeah. Podcast de- demand. Podcast demand. He's a and and big water. <laughs> big water. <laughs> oh, big water! You got to watch out for them. Yeah. We only drink big water. Oh yeah. We don't we got, support we, local. We got a big thirst, so we need a big water. Yeah, that's yeah. why I'm drinking three gallons at once. You know what a gallon is, do you? Gulp. It's a big old bucket, isn't it? Mm. No, no, whatever. How isn't it? How big's a gallon? Like I think three and a half liters. That's a bit. No, oh, I meant bigger. What's a big tub of it? Big tub. Barrel. Like a megalitre? Three megalitres. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've really uh, sort of upped the scale there. That was good. I don't know what a megalitre is. Megalitres aren't a thing, Megalitre. Are yeah, megalitres. Why? What? What? I mean. Well, so, what's a megalitre? That's what Megatrot drinks. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Now I'm back on board. He drinks a me- megalitre of horse liquid. Water. Water, yes. <laughs> the original in, term in for... the horse community, they call it horse water. No, that was the original name for water. Horse water. No, horse liquid. Horse oh, liquid. Okay. Sorry, I forgot. It's very confusing because I would think that's piss. <laughs> ah, see that—that <laughs> that is confusing. That is confusing. Very confusing. You don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. No, uh, horse liquid. No, thank you. I'll just have a water. Oh, I'm afraid that water's the old name for piss. Ah, <laughs> oh, dear. horse piss. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta get this right. You get this right. It is, um, I believe. It the is last... called love. Just as it is the rhythm of a heart. There's a chance we can make it now. We'll be rocking till the sun goes down. I believe it is called love. Ooh. Guitar. What ha- yeah, that was the best bit, guitar. Agreed. So, what happened to the darkness? This week's topic. What happened really? to the darkness? No, that's the band that's had that song. I'm aware. Oh, sorry. The way you said that was like... Um, yeah, because you... Because the question <laughs> implies that the darkness it had one album fell off the face of the earth. Yeah. Well, and actually, how fucking dare you? Well, I believe... I don't know if this is hyperbole I read in a, a rock and roll mag, but the singer had to he uh, call the band off for a few years because he um, couldn't... He was growing a moustache. No, he couldn't stop partying. Correct. By being in a band. Is that right? He was doing too many... Too many uh, he went to rehab. Substances. But, and like, but being in a band is not really good for rehab. That's Second album came out, better bass player. What? It didn't have that guy with the cool curly hair. But third third album, he was back. He was back. Yeah. yeah. With the big moustache and the headband. I've seen him live. Justin's voice is that good live. I didn't realise you were a big fan. You didn't pick me to be the Darkness fan, did you? No. I'm not a big fan, but I've seen them a few times. I love them. They're great fun. What do you mean a few times? I've seen them like three times. They Where? Like festivals. At their own at festivals or on their own? Uh, I saw them uh, fe- two festivals and once on their own show, the old Metro yeah, I think we were just disgusted that we were probably at the same show. Probably. Odds Years are. before we knew each other. Gosh. Oh, they were awesome. I was so close to the front of the stage. I had no idea I was in the room with such cool rock and roll fans. The yeah. Darkness. Yeah. The Darkness cool. I guess. had a poster of them on my wall as a teenager. 
Oh, that is awesome. I really love the darkness. I've got a t-shirt. I fucking love the darkness. Every time you went to bed, did you just point to the poster and go, guitar, turn the Deal, light off? Meow, meow. Yeah. The first time I saw them at a festival, they played like a 40-minute set. It was when the first album was out, so they didn't. They only had an album's worth of tracks. 40-minute <laughs> set, and he had a costume change in the middle. That's amazing. Fantastic. Mm. Yeah, they're cool. I once saw um, uh, Morrissey. So, sorry, sorry. That's a make, real sorry, change of gear. Sorry to make it about a, a really cool guy, but um, yeah, what he's been well, like around Christmas time. He's, he's he doesn't say some great, some great stuff lately, but uh, it's a he's a rock and roll icon. And um, even though he's in his fifties, he took his shirt off three times. Yeah, mm. and then what? Put the same shirt back on. <laughs> Different shirt. Then then he came out draped in the Australian flag. Of course, that had to go. Sure, <laughs> yeah, of course it did. <laughs> Moz, what are you doing? Of course it bloody did. Moz. You're the same age as my mum. You're sixty. That's great. Anyway, we've we've gone we've gone on a look. It's the man of a thousand noises. Yeah, they're good. Number eighty, Morrissey. <laughs> we've gone on a tangent early because Dave, Sorry. you have mentioned that this is probably the longest report you've ever written. I believe word count wise, this is the longest one ever. So oh. we should get into it. And that's unfortunate because the Sass twins are in full swing tonight. Oh dear. Feeling you? sassy. <laughs> All right, Jess, but before I get into this mammoth topic, I have to give a mammoth ad for our Melbourne Comedy Festival shows. I'll make it quick. It's coming up uh, next month now, because technically I believe the last one's right on the the end of March, uh, four Saturday afternoons at the European Beer Cafe. Going to be a lot of fun. Please come on down. There is a ticket link in this description. We are hoping to sell them out and then upgrade them to Rod Laver Rod and, Laver, and yep. support the darkness. Yeah. <laughs> well, darkness will support. Oh, sorry. Yeah. They'll open for us. Where I think we're getting pretty close to selling out uh, the show, so it's that exciting. Um, I don't know. I said it like that. I've also <laughs> I'm in Perth right now, which obviously isn't true because we recorded this before I left. But um, still, a few shows for me over here in Perth, where I am right now at the Fringe <laughs> World, and you can get tickets via mattstewartcomedy.com slash gigs. Also for Adelaide, which will be there in about a week and a half. Then Brisbane. Then. Melbourne. So everyone, come get a piece. Get of a the piece. Man. Get a piece of the action. I'm just in Melbourne, so um, I suppose just like like my Facebook page and um, tweet me if you want to get in contact. That's that's fine. I got Instagram. I love Instagram. Um, Always gramming. I do a lot of Instagram stories too. So if you want a real behind the scenes of what I'm up to, which mm. no doubt you do, I do. Um, can you can do that? I got a lot going on. Yeah, just uh, tweet me if you want to hang out. Please. <laughs> Please, sweetest. All right, on with this week's show. So if you haven't heard the show before, what happens is one of us has been given a topic suggested by the listeners. For the listeners. That's right, by the <laughs> listeners, for the listeners. We're about you, listeners. And uh, it's my week this week to my report. My week. And, this is uh, my week. My week. It's a week we celebrate Mars everywhere. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to report on a topic. Jess and Matt don't know what it is. And I've got a question to get us onto that topic. And Excellent. I say... When I say, oh, the humanity, what? George Costanza. No, wait. <laughs> is it George? No. Was it when the, was it Newman? It's Newman, right? I re- I rem- there's definitely a Seinfeld reference to it. I think it's when Newman's mail truck catches fire. <laughs> yeah. I think. Oh, the Does he say Newman weird? Newman. 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 A- yeah, I think we'd say Newman. 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 It's like how people from Sydney say stupid. Do they? That's a Sydney yeah, thing? It's a Sydney thing. That's stupid. <laughs> <laughs> um, so when I say oh, the humanity, what it's do you think, the, of? You think of? I was going to say the Sunder. Gutenberg, but that was an actor from Police Academy, wasn't it? It's actually the Hindenburg. <gasps> this week's topic is the Hindenburg oh, disaster. Cool. Exciting? I mean, not cool. <laughs> oh. What a monster. It, it's a ripping tale, I will tell you. And oh, sadly for me, it does feature a few Nazis. So, okay. <laughs> problematic. No comment. Sadly for you. Well, it just means that I know that. Because, oh, oh, yeah, you dislike Nazis. Yeah. And researching them really hurt. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, this topic, the Hindenburg, was been, has been suggested by two of our listeners Austin McPherson at Abso I Lover 2001. Abso I Lover. Mm. And someone who's just put their name as me or at Yink Scrawler. Oh, I reckon we've had me, uh, Yink Scrawler. Before. Before. Wow. Well, good suggestions. Thanks, me. And I really like. Me. 
I like me a lot, and I think um, <laughs> I think I think me enjoys when we talk about me because it sounds funny <laughs> to me, it does. but also to him, me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've just had my brain explode. <laughs> my brain, not. Me's brain. <laughs> All right, so I had me brain explode. <laughs> Me's brain exploded. <laughs> All right, um, so we're going to have a brief history here to get us uh, towards the Hindenburg. Give a bit of background, just to start off with. Do you know the technical difference between an airship and a blimp? Yes. Great. No. Moving on. <laughs> Is one filled with air and the other one's filled with a gas? One's filled with a blimp. <laughs> Can you? Is one of them you're inside the the it, balloon and you're bouncing around, having a good time? Yeah, and the other one's very boring. It's all about capacity, <laughs> you know. Yeah, you're inside them both, but one of them you're having a good time. <laughs> the other one's very rigid and boring. Yeah. Well, one is very rigid. They are both lighter than air vehicles, meaning they're filled with a gas. So they're both filled with gas that's lighter than the air around us. So when you let them go, much like a helium balloon, they just raise. Except, unlike a balloon, they have an engine that can be steered. From point A to point B. That's what balloons have been missing all this time. I've always said that. Yep. I have always said that. Your idea was to add an engine to a balloon. Yeah. Then you could then you got a fucking party. remote control balloon, baby. Yeah, <laughs> that's good. <Ooh> woo! <laughs> so an airship, also called a dirigible. Excuse A dirigible. Dirigible. It's a technical term. I fucking love it. It's I love it. It's ador- adorable. Oh, boy. <laughs> also colloquially called a Zeppelin, which is the famous company that made the air, oh. airships like the Hindenburg. Also cool. What an airship or a dirigible has is they have a metal type of framework or a skeleton that an outer skin wraps around it. Right. So when there's no hydrogen or helium gas inside them, there's still a solid shape. Got right. it. But a blimp, like the famous Goodyear blimp or the Duff blimp on the Simpsons, has no metal framework, so it's more like a giant inflatable pool toy. So when you take the gas away, it goes right. to a sad mess on the easier, ground. Easier to pack. Easier for storage. Put yeah. it under your bed, put it in your cupboard. Whatever. Put it in the suitcase. Yeah. Take it on holiday. Pop it in a suitcase. Take your blimp. Yeah. You can fly anywhere with that blimp. <laughs> anywhere. How far can you fly in a blimp? Well, a long way. The Hindenburg went, flew from one continent to another, Fuck. which we'll get to. Uh, there's also a halfway point called a semi-rigid where they have a bit of framework, but the Hindenburg is a fully... Half mongrel. Half, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the Hindenburg is a, is a full mongrel. <laughs> Nothing's bringing that bad boy down, except a horrible fire, which we'll get to. Same for a stiffy. <laughs> yeah. Nothing will bring those down yeah. but a horrible fire. Oh, man. I've seen a couple go down due to fire. Dave. No more uh, No more evidence. No, no more. <laughs> <laughs> no more evidence. No more evidence, Your Honour. I've got to go. Oh, no. <laughs> Bye. Ah. The defence rests. <laughs> Uh, the modern era of flight really took off in France in 1783 when wealthy paper magnates, the Montgolfier brothers. Fuck yeah. How good is that name? Montgolfier. Montgolfier. Yeah. Demonstrated uh, the first lighter than air hot air balloon. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. The Chinese had been using hot air powered lanterns for centuries, but the Montgolfier brothers were inspired when they noticed heat put into a bag made it rise. I wonder when they first put heat in a bag. Farted in a bag. Farted in a bag. <laughs> One says to the other, I oh, might check this out. <laughs> Oh, look at that go. I mean, we've all farted in a bag. They and just they, made a business out of it. And they yeah. thought, if we get a 1,000 people to fart into this bag, <laughs> we could fly to the moon. <laughs> I've said it before. It's a great idea. <laughs> uh, they built their own silk and paper lined balloon and tested it without anyone on board, and it was a success. That was a smart idea, not putting unreal. someone on board. Well, they were, they were asked to demonstrate their invention for the king, so they enlisted the help of wallpaper maker Jean-Baptiste Revillon. Another great name. Look, if I say it so confidently... Sounds like I know what I'm saying. Yeah, <laughs> sounds like you said it right. Uh, this time they constructed an even bigger and better balloon. And at this time, it wasn't known if going to a high altitude in an open basket would kill humans because humans had never been up into the atmosphere before. So, of course, the king suggested, let's test it on prisoners. <laughs> let's test it on what? Prisoners. prisoners. Oh, right. But instead, the Montgolfier brothers chose to test the invention by putting on board a sheep, a duck, and a rooster. <laughs> Which would have been a crazy trip for the sheep. What a weird and the combo. Duck and the yeah, what do they think Why they were going to get three? three different bits of data back? It's like, it's interesting. The, the duck, duck exploded. <laughs> <laughs> the sheep is fine. The rooster. Has the never we been need the more same. tests. More ducks. <laughs> the rooster Maybe. jumped out. Fetch a lavash. 
Yeah, well, you know what happens when the duck explodes? The next test always has to be a fox, a grey head gnat, and also a beaver <laughs> with a little hat. And a gun. Why has he got a gun? Self defense. To be said, he got two bullets. <laughs> He either takes the other two out or takes that one out then himself, mm. which is what happened. <gasps> no, the eight-minute two-mile flight across the Royal Palace of Versailles was the first flight ever to carry a living creature, and it was successful, so they didn't die. None of the animals died. No ducks exploded during this flight. No. Well, that's great news. Well, I was going to say it was disappointing, so we <laughs> are not in sync today. <laughs> A couple of weeks later, also in France, inventor Jacques Charles and the Roberts Brothers, which is an amazing band name, yeah, Jacques Charles and the Roberts Brothers, demonstrated a different type of flight they'd been working on, a balloon filled with hydrogen. This flight lasted a whopping two hours and five minutes, hmm. a lot longer than, Mon- than the Montgolfier Brothers, and even had more advanced controls, such as a hydrogen release valve and sandbag ballast. They could go left and right. Wow. Not just up and crash. <laughs> Put it in crash. <laughs> uh, a couple of months later, they even had a manned flight. Oh, so they uh, they put them up. So that's a very basic introduction to this new phase of light, lighter than air aviation travel. And over the next century, many improvements were made to the point that it actually became a feasible source of travel. Interesting. People started thinking we could move people properly in these things and make money. Ah. An important person in what would become the golden age of airship travel. Was it Sir William Blimp? <laughs> Willie Blimp. <laughs> or won't he? He will. <laughs> he will blimp. No, it's a German man named Count Ferdinand von Zeppelin. Yes. <sighs> so kind of, he's the German Willie Blimp. Ferdinand von Zeppelin. Mm. That's a sick name. Fuck yes. Count Ferdinand von That's Zeppelin. That's awesome. One. What's the lady version of a count? Countess. Ah. Or Countessa. Ooh. Countessa Bop. I like it. Ah. Bop Zeppelin. <laughs> von Zeppelin. Countessa Bop von Zeppelin. Bop von Zeppelin. That's a great name. Yeah, that's a great name. Thank you. Thanks so much. Yep. Well, the man, the magic uh, Ferdinand von Zepp, as I call him. Sure. Born in 1838, he had his first military commission at the age of just 20. He made the first of several balloon ascensions uh, in Minnesota while acting as a military observer for the Union Army during the American Civil War. Oh. I guess the idea there was that he went up in a balloon tethered to the ground and used it as like a lookout. Go cool. up in the air. Have a look. Uh, in 1890, uh, after a lot of military stuff, so four decades, he retired from the military and devoted his life to creating a rigid type of airship, one with a metal skeleton. It took him 10 years to get the idea off the ground. Pun intended. Oh, we could tell. Your face did a run-up to that joke. (laughs) Well, I wouldn't call it a joke. I'd call it... uh, Well, I'd call it a joke. joke. (laughs) His first flight, July 2nd, 1900, saw the LZ-1, as he called it, travel a small distance from a floating hangar on Lake Constance near Friedrichstrafen in Germany. And whilst it was not entirely successful, it had the effect of promoting the airship to the the degree that public subscriptions and donations thereafter funded the Count's work. Oh, wow. So you've got a bit of crowdfunding going on. People saw it. It was like the, you know, a GoFundMe video. People watch it and went. Yeah, an early early Patreon. We can get behind this. Hmm. Uh, The German government quickly noticed the advantage of airships over the as yet poorly developed aeroplanes. And when a Zeppelin achieved a 24-hour flight in 1906, he received commissions for an entire fleet. All in all, more than 100 Zeppelins were used for military operations in the First World War. What? I had no idea. Yeah, so they were, you know, because planes weren't super reliable. As the war went on, they got bigger and better, as you know, as we've talked about before. Nothing mm. like a war to get innovations happening. But our Zeppelins were, you know, seen as a, a, a real way for um, carrying people and also bombing stuff. Sure. And also the fact that when they come over the hill, they look incredibly intimidating because they're massive. Mm. Uh, the company set up a passenger service in 1910. Zeppelin's dream was transcontinental flight, but sadly he died in 1917 before this could happen. Hmm. But after World War I, the US armed forces began building their own fleet of airships. The largest they ever built was the USS Akron, built in Akron, <gasps> Ohio. Wow. Now, that's something we haven't mentioned for a while. Now, Matt, how am I supposed to say Akron again? 
I'm sure that someone told me it was meant to have a W sound in it, but then someone else said that that is definitely not true. <laughs> I've heard you say Orcron. Orcron? 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 No, I don't know. I'm offended on behalf of. Yeah, but it's Ohio. definitely not Akron because that's how we used to say it and people did not like it. Someone will let us know. Oh, the humanity. Akron, where tires come from. Oh, the Goodyear blimp. Yes. It all makes sense. Absolutely. I think that is actually where it comes from. Wow. Wow. Uh, unlike the Hindenburg, the Akron, or Orkron, wasn't filled with uh, flammable. I think it's Orkron. <laughs> That I think that's good? right. It wasn't filled with flammable gas like hydrogen. This one, like the um, like the Hindenburg, mm. but the rarer but less flammable helium. Uh, the Orkron was the world's first purpose-built flying aircraft carrier carrying FC9 Sparrowhawk fighter planes, which could be launched and recovered while she was still in flight. Which is pretty amazing. So planes come out of the blimp, go around, and come back into the blimp. What? I say blimp. I'm going to get in trouble for that airship. Thank you. <laughs> I was about to get. Oh, you were about to get in trouble for that. Yeah, right here. How big is it? Massive. Holy shit! That big. <laughs> oh, it's, and it's the biggest one they ever made. Uh, sadly, the Orkron was destroyed in a thunderstorm off the coast of New Jersey on the morning of the fourth of April, nineteen thirty-three, <laughs> killing seventy-three. <laughs> no, so you slip it in, and I'm trying to tell you that seventy-three of seventy-six crewmen and passengers died. Yeah, but three survived. Well. Is that Google coming back for another round? It was, it was Newman. <laughs> okay. <laughs> is it the... I didn't even mean to do that, but it is him. He's driving his mail truck. And it's on fire. And it's on fire because I think, like, Kramer dropped, like, there was, like, a... Oh, God, fuck it. It's been hey, we... several weeks now and you still <laughs> can't figure out, out how to use your fucking what is phone. Going on? But he, yeah, there was like, there were, was it the one where he, Kramer had his own section of highway and he and he made it roomier? So he made his little section so everyone had like a lane and a half. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was clear, maybe it's on emerging ideas and then, but it, an iron got caught under the thing. And it yeah, that's right, sparking. sparking. Yeah. That's right, yep. Yeah. And there was petrol, on, oil on the road or something. Yeah. And then it, <laughs> humanity. And the flames come oh, across the dashboard. As a kid would have laughed and laughed and then would have had no idea what the reference was. <laughs> oh, the humanity, that's funny. <laughs> Newman said it. <laughs> Newman. Newman. Oh, this is funny. You haven't seen Seinfeld, have you? Nah. It's really, I've got the box set if you want to borrow it. Nah. It's so great, isn't it? You should it? really so check great. it out. So great. So easy to watch heaps and heaps of it. Yeah. If you feel like nothing about me, as soon as you tell me to do something, I am 100% not going to do it. A show you will hate is called Seinfeld. I'm going to watch the box set. <laughs> oh. If only I knew someone who owned it. Well, I don't want you to borrow it. Give it to me. Okay. Yes. Huh. Oh, it worked out well. Two positives are there. <laughs> uh, but back to the Orcron. So it was a big disaster. This accident involved the greatest losses of life in any airship crash. Even so more than the Hindenburg. 73 out of 76. Yep. Wow, that's awful. Uh, the worst part being that a second airship that went out looking for survivors also crashed. Oh, Jesus. Killing two more people. No. So, pretty bad. So airships um, didn't have the best safety record. In fact, here are a few more of the worst crashes before the Hindenburg leading up to it. Oh, so dear. in 1921, at the time, the world's largest largest airship was the British R-38. R-30, Ape. R-38. Oh, so that's a much more intimidating name, the R-38. Uh, it was destroyed by a structural failure while in flight over the city of Hull. It crushed into the Humber estuary, killing 44 out of the 49 crew on board. Then the next year, 1922, the Italian airship, the Roma, which was purchased by the US from the Italian government, crashed in Norfolk, Virginia, killing 34 people. Oh, dear. It was the last hydrogen-filled airship flown by the US military. All subsequent uh, ships were inflated with helium including the orc run I spoke about before, and that still didn't go well. So they're just I'm going sure through. They're, not... they're working their way through the periodic table. <laughs> yeah, Next I is lithium. Helium. Okay, beryllium. Google, how do you I pronounce Akron, Ohio? Lithium, Ohio. beryllium. What's Matt doing over there? Okay, Google, how do you pronounce Akron, Ohio? That's pronounced Akron, Ohio. Well, I mean, Akron. She, she also has an Australian accent. So. Oh, does she? Yeah, right, so that doesn't help. That doesn't help. Uh, the Dixmude was built by the Germans. That's great. What the what? The Dick Dick Dixmude. Dick Spewed. The Dick Spewed. Oh, yeah. The Dick Spewed. Oh, Dick Spewed. Dick Spew. Dick Spew. Dick Spew. 
You're talking about jism? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's funny. Thank you. That's rule number one of comedy. Jism's, jism's funny and funny's funny. Imagine a dick spewing. I should have made that noise. <laughs> <laughs> that felt good. <laughs> anyway, the dick smear is built by the Germans. Uh, given to France after World War One as part of raw uh, war reparation, but the that totally backfired when it exploded in midair. 1923 off the coast of Sicily, killing 52. Yeah. Then in 1930, the new king of the world's largest airships, the British R101, crashed in uh, France. During its maiden overseas voyage, killing 48 out of 54. Why did they stick with these things? Stop flying well, them anywhere. After that, the British gave up. They called it. They called it a day. They're like, this is enough. Classic Brits. So, so as Quitters. you can see. <laughs> <laughs> Let's keep throwing people out. It'll be right. It'll be right. So as you can see, it's not super duper safe sounding. Although in fairness, I will say to an outsider, if you listed all the aeroplane or train crashes ever yeah. and just gave it to them without any other data, you'd be like, why are we using those? Yeah, true. Good point. So, Do a lot of aeroplanes explode midair? Not enough. <laughs> what? David. Not enough to correlate with any data is what I mean. Right. Oh, okay. <laughs> Fool. Fool. What a You've really got to finish your sentences, man. <laughs> <laughs> Not enough. <laughs> to correlate. <laughs> Sorry, I have a tonal problem. I'm a scientist. Not if a... I had my way, we'd have more data. <laughs> Of course, I'd rue the loss of life. <laughs> uh, but now we've come to the Hindenburg. Uh, the D-Lag, which is a, an acronym, um, which <laughs> translates to an, a, a German, German thing that translates as German Airship Travel Corporation, uh, okay. was the world's first commercial airline service. It was founded in 1909 and then in 1935 merged with the, with the DZR, whose fleet included the LZ-129 Hindenburg. Hmm. That's Hindenburg's just a cool, like, it's fun to say. Mm. Have it a go. Fun. Hindenburg. Was that fun? Yeah, that was great fun. Everyone, Dave. everyone a go. We'll pause for you to have a go. Fun, wasn't it? So fun. fun. Hindenburg. I went back for seconds. Yeah, good on you. Why not? Yeah. I'm to keep saying it. It's Hindenburg. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see if I can find an appropriate time between now and the end of the episode to say Hindenburg okay. again. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, what about a restaurant? The Hindenburger. Oh, that's fun. Airship themed. Mm -hmm. right. Disaster themed. So the restaurant has got the name of an item on the menu. Yeah, it's the best selling item. So they just. Hindenburger yeah. King, sort of. That's good. And they only sell hot dogs. Yeah. Fun twist. Because fuck everyone. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> some people just want to watch the world burn, <laughs> like the Hindenburg. <laughs> uh, the Hindenburg began construction in 1931 and it took uh, its first flight five years later. So. Long project. It was named after the late field marshal, Paul von Hindenburg. That's cool. Even though he's a bit tardy, they still named it after him. I think that's great. <laughs> he was, it was <laughs> always took late. It too long to get it. Me too. I was like, I was like, oh. what? Oh, the late. Po okay. But uh, also, when you've got a boring name like Paul, yeah. I'm glad you followed it up with von yeah. Hindenburg. He was like, well, I mean, his pet, the thing that his parents chose was true. Was very bland. So lucky. It's lucky. funny. You'd think a Hindu maybe they were sick of being so interesting. Interesting. I can only I can only say that must be the case. Yeah. Uh, he was also the president of Germany from 1925 until he, until he died in 1934. He actually had a quite a bit to do with how Hitler came to power. It's oh. actually Heil Hitler. <laughs> oh, sorry. How Heil Hitler came to power. Thank God I'm editing this episode. <laughs> I don't even know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Which isn't that far different from mm. all the time. Interesting. Okay. Right. So he kind of, he was actually the opposition to Hitler, but then the Nazi party started getting lots of seats in the, in their um, their voting houses and he sort of had to make these concessions. And then he died. And when he died, Hitler stepped in oh, okay. and declared uh. himself... I'm in charge of everything, and that's sort of where it all went wrong. Okay, okay. When you said that before, I was like, oh, no, he was like, guys, let's make Hitler the boss. No, it was actually in opposition to him. So his death, which he had no control over. Because he was very old. Yeah, led to Hitler. Okay, 
So he's a good guy. Can, well, I, I haven't done you... enough research to say if he was a good guy. I don't know. It's in the hat many times, Dave, but could you one day do the rise of Hitler? Well, if we do this ship uh, in international waters, then maybe I'll do it. God. We do this podcast, not this ship. He's really pushing. This ship? He's really pushing for international waters. Yeah. I just think it would be really fun to get a whole bunch of podcast listeners. Oh, my God. Onto a boat and go to international waters. I've got it. Yes, we can do it if mm. I get to dress you in a little sailor suit like a little boy. That would be fun. Oh, my God. You could be a pirate with that beard. Okay. I'm going to be a wench. <laughs> ah, so sailor, pirate, and wench. Yeah. What's a wench again? Is that a, is that a nautical thing? Yep. Yeah, right. Cool. Wench. Oh, you got me to put in little shorts and a little hat. Oh, my God. I'm going to be a little fucking lollipop. Blonde curly wig. Big, yes. Yes. On the good ship. Lollipop. Yes. I'll do it. If I'm in international waters, anything goes. Yes. All right, I'm in. Please do go on. You really love international waters. I just love the idea of doing a pod out there. We'll probably get take like on The Simpsons when they go out there and then a bunch of pirates <laughs> capture them. It's like, oh. We've already got a pirate and you just point to me and I'm going to win You're good, to, thanks. You have to do the negotiations. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we're more the modern day pirates with like machine guns and rocket launches. So yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Have some. That's all you can say. <laughs> yeah. I haven't had a lot of time to research for this character. Me hearties. Me hearties. Uh, walk the plank. Yeah. yeah, that's good. Anyway, Dave, keep going. You're doing great. Love you. Thank you. Love you both. Oh, that's interesting. He didn't. Matt didn't say he loved you. I know. That's why I looked at him to try and coax one out of him. Love you, Dave. Thank you. No, I, I'm doing this more for someone else. Oh. I'm looking at her. Save her. Oh. Love you, Jess. <laughs> it feels forced now. Uh, love you, wench. Oh. <laughs> wench Perkins. <laughs> <laughs> wench wench is a, it's a funny word. I have no idea what it means. Oh, I have some idea. I don't think it's positive, though. I, don't I think, think it, it is. definitely sounds derogatory. I'm looking at a girl or young woman, archaic slash humorous. Oh. the Or... A prostitute. There you go. Two <laughs> options there. Let's so it's just a young, uh, it's just a woman. Was the first one? It's female, basically. Yeah, yeah the but they're humorous. Was, well, it, um, they have like little. Um, subs- a humorous woman. No, it has subsections. So it's like this type of language is archaic or used humorously. Right. Then the definition, a girl or young woman. Definition two, this type is archaic, a prostitute. I'm prostitute. Looking- I mean, the word prostitute's relatively archaic, isn't it? We say sex work now, don't we? Hmm. There you go. I'm just reading off Google. No one get angry. Uh, okay, back to the Hindenburg. Interesting that you want to get back to the topic. Sure. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Do go on, please, Dave. Uh, two were built, two identical ones, the LZ-129 and the LZ-130, and they are still the largest airships ever built. What's the L? So the Z is uh, the Z is Zeppelin. Zeppelin. I'm not 100% sure. It's not Led Zeppelin. No. But we'll talk about Led Zeppelin a little bit later. Yes. Uh, they are still the largest airships. They're pretty much the largest things to ever fly, uh, both by length and volume. Even bigger than the blue whale? Wow. Yeah, That's fly- huge. The flying blue whale. <laughs> All right. The ship was 245 metres or 800 feet, under and four. Sorry, the, bl- the blue whale is a flightless whale. I just looked it up. Thank God for Google. <laughs> okay, Google. Can blue whales fly? Okay, Google, can wow. blue whales fly? She won't even answer a question like that. <laughs> uh, just so you can imagine how big it is, the ship was 245 metres or 804 feet long, Fuck. 41 metres or 135 feet in diameter, which to put it into perspective is longer than three Boeing 747s placed end to end. Don't tell me another airship. Tell me, give me a, how many Olympic pools? Longer. <laughs> Well, I'm sorry to say it again, but it's longer than four Goodyear blimps end to end and only 24 metres or 75 feet shorter than the Titanic. And the Titanic sank. (laughs) Yeah, because is this sort of the Titanic of the sky or vice versa? Yeah. Well, that's what we're calling the episode. (laughs) The Titanic of the sky. In brackets, Hindenburg. (laughs) Uh, Or we could call the Titanic the Hindenburg of the seas. I think that would be easier. Seas? Seas. 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 Multiple seas. There's, there's a few. Yeah. It's all right. I'm just checking. The seven seas. That's where I sail as a pirate. 
All right, mate. That's true. <laughs> uh, so it's pretty much it's something the size of the Titanic, but it flies. So it's huge. Insane. Uh, the outer sh- uh, Is outer that a poop deck? It's got several. <gasps> what? Hundred. <gasps> poop poop decks. decks. Yeah, it was literally covered in shit. <laughs> <laughs> um, the outer skin of the airship was made from strong poop. P- strong poop <laughs> mixed with cotton and linen. Mm. It was then made waterproofed with poop. <laughs> And then tightened with a mechanical paint known as dope, which could have been a terrible mix-up. <laughs> paint it with dope. Okay. <laughs> dope is a slang term for marijuana. <laughs> <laughs> That's where the humour of that bit comes from. You are the coolest stepdad <laughs> on the podcast. Like, what you got to know about <laughs> cannabis is it's got a couple of names. Dope. Weed. <laughs> grass. <laughs> Fun grass. <laughs> <laughs> Leaves of high. Better than tea. Not as good as heroin. <laughs> now, you, now you have a try, little Jimmy. That's a cool dad. Um, <laughs> you're, no, I didn't say coolest dad. I said stepdad. Uh, okay, I'm a cool stepdad. You're definitely a cool stepdad. I'm, I'm sterile, so... <laughs> Too much dope, Dimmy. Dimmy. Dimmy, I'll call you Dimmy. <laughs> Just go on with the longest report you've ever written. I'm actually high now. <laughs> so inside this thick skin, <laughs> the outer skin, painted with dope for some reason, were 16 separate gas bags. <laughs> <laughs> so people that talked a lot. <laughs> yeah. Quit your bloody gas bag. Uh, bloody gas bags. Are these gas, gas bags, bags really good, Jess? <laughs> <laughs> no, I loved it. So, you never know. Sometimes I, you can predict where it will come, and other times you're like, wow, gas bags. Gas bags. <laughs> Just a little fact there. Yeah. <laughs> gas <laughs> bags. <laughs> Still got to. I'm, I'm annoyed that I'm not going to mention them that much more. Mm. Uh, each of these gas bags <laughs> are over 30 metres in height, and they were all filled with f- the flammable gas of hydrogen. So what could possibly go wrong? Stop using hydrogen. All up. There was nearly 200,000 cubic metres of hydrogen. So a shitload. And this is very highly flammable. But because it's lighter than air, the lightest element on the periodic table, it makes the whole thing float. Wow. So you put a lot of a, a lot of floaty stuff in there and it floats. It's like in Up when he has all those helium balloons. Yeah, you, know, you just have enough helium, it'll lift a house. Right. That, that's science. That's science, bitch. Deal with it. Right. You just got science, son. Ow. <laughs> Ow, my arm. Stop that. I punched him when I said that. I got yeah. really enthusiastic. Uh. Somehow you're a nerd bully. Yeah. Uh, the Hindenburg wasn't slow either. It could reach a top speed of 125 kilometres or 77 miles per hour, which, of course, by today's standards sounds quite slow. No, that's pretty fast. Okay, good. I thought you were going to not be impressed there. But for comparison, a transatlantic journey from Europe to the USA is 6,500 kilometres long. That would take an airship two and a half days, about half the time it would take for the fastest ocean liners of the day. Yeah. So you bloody doubled, doubled it. Bloody doubled it. Science. <laughs> you got science there. I think we just got mathed. Yeah. <laughs> a branch of science. <laughs> you got branched. Did you know I did a science in high school? You wouldn't pick it, would you? In the, like year in 12, VCA, the yeah, last yeah. year of school. Yeah, yeah, I did a science. What one? Psychology. <laughs> Oh. Counts. Does it count? Is that a science? I thought it was all bloody guesswork. Huh? It's all about feelings. Mm. I dropped science as soon as I could. Me too. I wish I didn't now because I wish I understood more about biology. Yeah. Wish yeah, I understood. Sure. Uh, the biggest Achilles heel of this giant airship. Was its Achilles heel? Was its Achilles heel. Why did they put one in? Some people thought it was dumb. <laughs> and it was. <laughs> now, the biggest Achilles heel, its weakness, was bad weather. It can easily be. It could easily be blown off course, and it struggled to fly in heavy winds. Oh my god! <laughs> this, in turn, can make landing quite treacherous. Hmm. Treacherous. Treacherous. Which, sadly, we will get to soon. <laughs> <laughs> I think bad weather's my Achilles heel too. Do you reckon going from from continent to continent, you, any chance of getting a little bad weather? I don't think so. Oh, thank god! If you're lucky, with a bit of luck, you'll be fine. You'll be right. It's such a funny. It's a funny thing to have stuck with. 
And of course, at this time, there's all those crashes I'd spoke about earlier, the leading decades, the decades leading up to this. But at this time, the Zeppelin company had a perfect safety record across 27 years. Right. Wow. So they're doing well. It was by no means cheap to travel on board either, with this type of travel considered to be extremely premium. It was, as I said, very fast, but also luxurious and limited to only a few passengers. Tickets cost $400. Whoa. Or closer to $7,000 US dollars in today's money. I can't picture what it would be like. Because I'm just imagining like the Simpsons when they're inside the blimp and it's just like an empty balloon. With Sideshow Bob? Yeah. But what's it actually like? Oh, I'll get there. I've got a, a good description of it. Oh, I'll judge it. Which a good is uh, now uh, this sentence that was coming up. Ah. What I didn't realise, Jess, about this ship was that the passenger decks where everyone hung out and slept were contained inside the actual hull of the ship, like you're imagining. Oh, okay. So they're not loose, I'll explain. I always imagined that everyone was in that little uh, cabin thing that's attached yeah. underneath. It turns out that's not the case, and that, that cabin thing is uh, attached to the balloon is called the gondola or crew car. Right. And this is where the captain and the crew actually flew it from. So do they're think, underneath. Hang on. Do you think while they're flying it in the gondola, they're going, When the moon hit your eye like a yes. big piece of summer. And they're very superstitious, so they do that for 24 hours. They're all wear stripes, T-shirts. If, if they stopped singing, they thought they would die. Mm. Is that a classic gondola song? Mm-hmm. Great. They sing to you. Did you go on? I didn't go on a gondola ride in Venice. Did you do that? I did. Good and, fun? Oh, yeah, it was great. And the guy, uh, the gondolier, was texting while he rode us along. While he sang. And oh, I said, tradition. And I said, have you ever dropped your phone in? And he goes, oh, no, I said, has anybody ever fallen in? And he said, no, but there is always first time. <laughs> <laughs> I thought he was going to murder me. <laughs> so uh, what you're imagining, the passengers are actually inside a section of the balloon. Okay. So they're not, it's not like the whole thing's hollow. They've just got a, a large section. So there's actually quite a lot of room. There was two decks, A deck and B deck. And inside A deck, there was a dining room, a lounge for relaxing, a riding room, and viewing areas. Riding? Of the... Sorry, writing room. Okay. I was like, they had. Rides. Oh, I was thinking Shetland ponies. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, also the riding room. Sorry. Uh-huh. <laughs> that was an expert. Now, they had viewing areas on either side of the aircraft, and almost all of the ship's 34 passenger cabins were on this side. B deck was where the crew slept, as well as the kitchen and bathrooms. And perhaps most ridiculously, the Hindenburg, which had more hydrogen than any other ship has ever had, had a smoking room. Oh, that's dumb. That's so dumb. No. <laughs> Bad idea. I know. That can't be the thing that brings it unstuck, surely. I can't confirm nor deny. Oh, uh, well, passengers, their lighters and matches were confiscated before they boarded. And inside the smoking room, they only had one electric lighter, so it didn't produce a flame. And uh, on board, they could buy cigarettes and Cuban cigars. As a safety precaution, I will say, it did have an airlock to keep the lit cigarettes away from the flammable gas. But to me, it just seems like too big a risk. Yeah, yeah that's dumb. What I would have done is still sold the cigars, but just made them eat them if they want them. you got to eat them. That's it. I think that's very reasonable. I think that's a fine compromise. I think that's a fine compromise. Thank you. I'm sure let's get the nicotine somehow. Yeah. You'd right. be right. Right. How about you just um, have a spoonful of concrete and harden the fuck up? Mm. I mean, that can't be any more bad. Just go for you. two days without one. Hmm. 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 Mm. Hmm. That's what I thought. I'm so sorry. Jeez, I mean, we're casting aspersions now against the smokers. We might find out that it was one of the non-smokers who was, you know, rubbing two sticks together. Mm. We just don't know. Just for we fun. Just don't know. In the writing room. Not in the writing room. It's all those flammable. Exercise books, which I imagine they would have had. Books. 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 That's what you write on. Got it. Speaking of flammable, Matt, many times when I was researching this topic, I asked myself, why was it filled with a flammable gas when helium was clearly being used by other ships? Because the helium would make your voice all funny. Right. That is one of the answers. <laughs> the other answer is, it turns out after the disastrous crash of the hydrogen-filled British airship I mentioned before, the R101, Hindenburg designer Hugo Eckener sought to use helium. That's what he, That was his ideal situation. However, right. the United States at this time had a monopoly on the world supply of helium and, feel that, uh, and feared that other countries might use the gas for military purposes, so they banned its export and the Hindenburg was re-engineered because they could only get their hands on hydrogen. Imagine helium, though, for, as a weapon. <laughs> wow. I think it would sound a little something. <laughs> I like this. A beep, 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 beep. 
That's helium powered guns. Wow. Oh. Yeah. What number is that? 904? Yeah. <laughs> Someone should start keeping a chart. How does a country um, control. Have the monopoly on a. Yeah. Ga- yeah, that's. I assume that inside their territory is where. That's where helium comes from. The world's largest supply of helium at that time was. They had the helium mine. Now you can just go to, like, Lombard the paper people and get oh, a tank of it. They've got it. Mm. They have to use helium at Lombard the paper people rather than uh, the flammable one because they've got so much paper. I asked them, well, for those balloons I got for our 100th, I asked for hydrogen in there, but uh, they said, no can baby doll, mm. helium for you. Why did you ask for hydrogen out of interest? Because I wanted to set it on fire. <laughs> Love it. I thought that would be so rock and that roll. That would have been spectacular. Yeah. I wanted the best for you guys. Our 100th show is also the venue's last show because we burnt it down. That is so Fuck rock and roll. Yeah. Not to be the case, and now we have to go there for Comedy Festival. Damn it! No. Well done, Jess. I'm so dry, duh. Oh, Just use petrol next time. All right. There's some other flammable things. <laughs> Uh, anyway, what do these passengers have to worry about? The company had a good track record, and before the disaster, over the course of two seasons, the Hindenburg had already ca- carried over 2,500 people across the Atlantic between Germany and New York and then Rio de Janeiro. So they You'd be feeling pretty confident. You'd be confident. Mm. Like you get on a plane now. It's like, well, I suppose there's been disasters in the past, but it's been pretty good lately. Not, mm. not on Ansett Air, not yeah. I'm about to board with. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, unfortunately for me, because of the jokes that people make, it can't be skipped over that Adolf Hitler had become Chancellor of Germany in 1933. Also unfortunate for the people of Germany, I should say. And the world. Oh, Dave, are you saying? Yes. Were you saying there that Hitler rising to power affected you more than anyone else? <laughs> Dave. Hang on. Is that what you're saying? Look, it is not what I'm saying. Interesting. How he changes his tune. Mm. Uh, World War II was a couple of years away where the Hindenburg was flying around. But operating the largest ship ever built was seen as a potentially great PR move for the relatively new government, the Nazi Party. The Hindenburg had a large Nazi SWAT sticker on its tail and operating the largest aircraft ever was seen as a way of showing off the might of the country. Hmm. Nazi propaganda minister Joseph Goebbels ordered the Hindenburg to make its first public flight in March 1936 as part of an aerial tour of Germany. For four days, the airship blasted patriotic tunes and (laughs) pro-Hitler announcements from specifically mounted loudspeakers. And at the time, small parachutes with propaganda leaflets and swastikas were dropped on German cities. No. Isn't that that outrageous? That is incredible. And then later in 1936, the Hindenburg, with special Olympic rings painted on its side and pulling a large Olympic uh, flag behind it, made an appearance at the opening ceremony of the Berlin Olympics. Right. What? Hmm. I had no idea about any of that no, stuff. I do you know? That. Do you know much about the Berlin Olympics? I can't remember. Was that a, was that a, a point where people were already onto Hitler being a fuck fuck head? Yes. Or, so were people like boycotting and stuff? Uh, yes. Be- uh, I don't know if people were boycotting, but that was um, Jesse Owens, the famous black American runner. I remember he that really was in Berlin. He really upset Hitler by right. beating all his Aryan white people. Right. So, yeah, so America was there. Mm. So it was long before people were really taking a public stand against him. Yes. Well, that didn't really happen until right into the war, wasn't it? Because they kept thinking, oh, it's going to be okay. Anyway, we'll do it. I mean, it's kind of outrageous that they gave them the Olympics. (laughs) Everything about it is so bizarre. I'd love you to do an episode about that one day. Well, International Waters is calling. Why international? But imagine waters? him doing it in a little sailor suit. It'd be so funny. That'd be great. Oh, that God. would be great. That'd be so cute. It would be an interesting topic. Mm. Mm. No I'll, arguments here. I'll consider it. Thanks, Dave. I just don't want any. More it's been in the hat. People specifically asking for you to do it for and that's a long time. Because they enjoy making Nazi jokes, which I do not enjoy. No, but this these this goes way back. People have stopped doing that. They respect you now, as. You will ever since you um, publicly renounced your membership. <laughs> no, no, publicly denounced to the regime. Yeah. Which inside I'd been doing my whole life. Just hadn't done it publicly. Right. Yeah. It's sad that you had to do I it mean, publicly. Have any of you come out on the record and had to say no. <laughs> that you're anti-Hitler? No, we haven't had to do that. <laughs> haven't had to, no. Because it goes without saying for us. <sighs> oh, well. Now who's a fuckhead? You, Matthew. Oh, okay. Yeah, Matt was, was looking at me. I'm like, I'm not sure. 
<laughs> you are. Oh, it's always been me, sure. Now, who's the fuckhead? I'm sure you'll tell me. <laughs> uh, because it was such a symbol for the Nazis, the Hindenburg, on board, they were worried that anti-Nazis might sabotage the flight and reportedly they may have had an undercover plainclothes police officer on board. Could this be what caused the disaster? Oh. Foreshadowing. Uh, the flight path for what would be its final journey was from Frankfurt in Germany, where it would travel across the Atlantic Ocean and land at a naval station in Lakehurst, New Jersey. <laughs> Being on time was extremely important for the PR of the company, as well as the Nazis, as many rich and wealthy people were planning to catch the ship's return journey to attend the coronation of King George VI back in London on the 12th of May. So it's got to make it there so these rich people can get on board to get back to the UK. That's, uh, that's Elizabeth's grand- uh, fa- grandfather? Father. 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 King's speech. Father, yes. No, I think grandfather. No. Father, right. Father. No, the father, the one with uh, Bertie. Yeah. yeah, yeah, Bertie's the father. The father. Right, yeah, so, so the other guy's already dead. Yes, well, that's why. What, what year is this? Albert had to be. This is 19... 19- a 36. Gotcha. I watched that movie recently. Such a good movie. It's a pretty good movie. I saw it like three times at the cinemas. Wow. I really enjoyed it. Guys, don't panic, but it's just Dave here interrupting myself doing a report to quickly tell you that this episode is brought to you by a brand new sponsor, and that is Zip Recruiter. Don't worry, we'll get back to the explosions and the disaster of the Hindenburg real soon. But first, I've got to ask you a question. And that question is, are you hiring? Hmm? Posting your position to job sites and waiting and waiting for the right people to see it? Well, are you? Then why not try ZipRecruiter? ZipRecruiter learns what you're looking for, identifies people with the right experience, and then invites them to apply to your job. In fact... If I could just use some statistics to sell this to you here, 80% of employers who post a job on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate through the site in just one day. That's right. The right candidates are out there and ZipRecruiter is how you find them. So how much would you pay for this service? One million? Two million? Three million dollars? Wrong, because right now our listeners can try ZipRecruiter for free. That's right. Free. Nada. Nothing. Zilch. Another word for free. All you've got to do is go to ZipRecruiter.com slash DGO for this exclusive offer. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash DGO. Z-I-P Recruiter.com slash DGO. Insert another way of saying ZipRecruiter.com slash DGO. ZipRecruiter. It's the smartest way to hire. Thanks, ZipRecruiter. And now back to the Hindenburg. So the Hindenburg left Frankfurt. Left Frankfurt for New Jersey. (laughs) From now on, I will say every place name in that accent. <laughs> Excellent. Hindenburg left Frankfurt on the evening of May the 3rd. On board were 36 passengers, which is half its capacity, and 61 crew members. On board were people from Germany, Sweden, Mexico, the UK, Denmark, and the United States of America. <laughs> How come they had so many crew? That's heaps. I think well, it just had a lot of people to operate. Also, it's very luxurious, you've got to remember. Of so it's kind of like having everyone's in first class. But so everyone, like... Get- Every, pretty much everyone has like their personal crew member. I know that I know like you, the, you're not going to get the captain to get you a drink, but I'm just saying there's a lot of crew. Anyway, a lot of crew. Yeah, because I guess they also have people in the kitchen. You know, they got people cleaning stuff. They got a, a bunch of people flying it. Mm. Masseuse sigh. And when, the way that they fly it, if I am uh, correct, is uh, a long line of bicycles, stationary bikes. Mm, 61 people. 61 stationary bikes pedaling, pedaling, powering it. Pedal power. That's how they operate, yeah? Yep. Fantastic. Oh, is that true? So you do know a lot. Hmm. <laughs> That's one. Uh, so there's lots of different people on board from different backgrounds, and a really cool website we can look up and read about everyone is faceofthehindenburg.blogspot.com.au. And just a few of the people on board that we'll follow on, these are the more famous people that are often mentioned in documentaries about the Hindenburg and stuff. Uh, the captain, Captain Max Pruce. The Hindenburg was captained by this 46-year-old man, a highly experienced pilot who had flown for two decades and was captaining the Hindenburg on its 23rd flight. Huh. So he'd been at the helm many times. Also on board was Rudolf Anders, a 63-year-old man who was owner of the German uh, company T-Kane, that introduced tea in tins 
and an early precursor to tea bags. Hmm. So uh, he was a very, very wealthy man because of this. Uh, the company also invented the first machine that made tea bags. The first guy to mass produce tea bags. Hmm. Uh, today, the family run company is still the world leading company in the production of tea bags and produces seven and a half million of them every Just year. Just the bags? I think they're putting the tea in there as well. Wow. <laughs> Fully rounded business. Yeah. They've thought everything through. Like on The Simpsons when they go to the box factory and he's like, what's going to go in here? Uh, puppies, fireworks. Are any of those here? Oh, no, we just make boxes. And then they get, it turns out they get assembled at a separate factory. <laughs> <laughs> Follow the yellow line. <laughs> Around my office. <laughs> uh, Joseph Spar is a very interesting guy. I was on board. He was a young acrobat. He had immigrated to the USA and developed a comedy acrobatic act where he was called Ben Dover. <laughs> <laughs> you get it, man? Oh, uh, do you get it? Like Dover, the, the, the white cliffs in England. Yes, he was very ben pale. Ben Dover. He was, very pale. <laughs> do you used to do acrobats off a cliff, sort of. <laughs> that is good. Oh, man. It's got two meanings. It means both... No. Uh, Dover, his surname, and also Dover the city, like oh, the cliffs. Man. Oh, man. The white. The white. Uh, bloody cliff, they should have called him. <laughs> that's good. Should have called him Ben Cliff. Ben Cliff. Now that's funny. <laughs> oh, dear. Uh, this is a quote from the face of the Hindenburg block spot. Uh, his signature act as Ben Dover was to drunkenly stagger out on stage in a rumpled top hat and tails Search at length through his pockets for a cigarette, which, of course, was eventually discovered to have been in his mouth all along. Then he would shimmy up a pole of a gas street lamp to light his cigarette. No, Dave, no. Don't tell me Cliff did it. <laughs> Foreshadowing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he'd, um, he'd, he'd brought a dog with him to... Give to, oh, to give no. to his family as a surprise pet. Oh, and it the, caught fire. The dog did it. <laughs> Foreshadowing. The dog bit a hole in the in the Hindenburg. <laughs> <laughs> so the dog had to be kept underneath and to feed the dog, uh, Spa had to be accompanied by a crew member who would take him into that restricted area. Oh. But was he being a bit dodgy, maybe? <gasps> dog G. <gasps> Was he it being a bit sense. doggy oh. style, was bend he? Bend over. <laughs> he was bend overing doggy style. Oh, it all makes sense. It all makes sense. And the final people I'll introduce you to are the Derner family. A German family, the Derners were on board and included uh, Father Hermann, wife Matilda. Hermann Derner. Hermann Derner. Well, it gets, it gets better. <laughs> no, it can't get better than children, Hermann Derner. Children Irene, 14, Walter, 10, and Werner, Eight. Werner Derner. <laughs> oh, my God. He fucking told me it would get better than it did. Because I didn't think Werner you could top Derner. Herman Derner. And I was like, no, Dave, there's no fucking way. Irene Derner, fuck off. Oh, it's probably and Werner Derner. Derner. I was going to say if you pronounce Werner Derner. Werner Derner. <gasps> <gasps> Not Werner Derner the burner. <laughs> he did it. Foreshadowing. <laughs> <laughs> this is a real whodunit party. <laughs> it's great. It's a bit of a murder mystery. Who's going to do it? <laughs> Uh, So, Werner Derner, the youngest one, I'll talk about him later, and I'll talk about all of them. They were a wealthy family that lived in Mexico City, where their father had worked for a German company for two decades and had become a Mexican citizen. Interesting. Werner Derner. I'm going to name my first child Werner Derner. (laughs) One word? (laughs) Yes. So Hyphenated, actually. Werner Derner Perkins. (laughs) I'm also changing my name. It my is. surname will be Werner Derner. I think so Verna the kid D- will be Werner Derner, Werner Derner. Werner Derner would, uh, I reckon he, that, was that top 10 of the names we've ever had on the show? Yeah, I reckon it's top 10. <laughs> yeah, top 10. Werner Derner, Werner Derner. If I had more time, I'd go back through. I reckon at school, Werner Derner would be a great learner, don't you think? Yeah. <laughs> I just think he would be. What else would he be good at? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you know, um, You've already done I'd, Burner. I think he'd uh, he'd grow a, a lot of uh, forest plants. He'd be a Ferner Derner, be a great Ferner. <laughs> <laughs> I think he gets really into dairy at one point. <laughs> Ferner Derner, he does a lot of churning. Churner. I actually Ferner thought, Derner the churner. I heard that the youngest child is always, <laughs> youngest child's always. Um, I hate this and I love it. <laughs> youngest child. I, I don't know how I feel about it. <laughs> youngest child's always treated, you know. The most laps. I hear that his father was a lot uh, less sterner on the <laughs> <laughs> I love my job. 
<laughs> we are so stupid. <laughs> Just say it like the Sydney people do. Stupid. Stupid. An ideal. That's how they talk. <laughs> They're so wacky up there. Crazy. Get your shit together, Sydney. Uh, tweet in what you think Vernon Dern is up to. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to talk about him. Yeah, you're talking about it right now, mate. We're talking about it already, Jim. I'm going to talk about what he's up to. <gasps> oh, my God, no. It's, he's oh, not the one. He lives. He lives. Oh, shit. People survive. Maybe. You said what he's up to. In the heavens. But- <laughs> oh, my God, what a roller coaster. <laughs> <laughs> Matt doesn't know what to think. All right, so the Hindenburg. I keep forgetting that all these people are going to die. And the dog. The Hindenburg's crossing of the Atlantic went smoothly and not much of note happened. So the first couple of days, it's going swimmingly. However, by the time uh, it made it to the edge of the USA, it was running behind schedule because headwinds had slowed it down. The airship was about 12 hours behind its expected time when it passed over Boston on the morning of May 6th. And its landing at Lakehurst was expected to be further delayed because of afternoon thunderstorms. This was not good because, remember, it had a packed return flight to get it back on time. That had to get back on time. Landing at the Naval Air Station in Lakehurst was delayed even more due to the predicted bad weather. So the ship's captain, Max Proust, decided to linger over New York City, giving the people a spectacular view of the city and people of the city spectacular views of the ship. Mm, That's win. That's that's nicer than circling a city because... You know, in, in a plane, looking through a tiny window, it'd be a bit nicer from a blimp. Yeah, like actual airship proper windows. Yeah, and there's some famous photos from from the ground of the ship. Right across, it would be super frustrating at the same time. Every time there's any sort of bad weather or it gets a bit windy, that mm. your flight just gets delayed or cancelled. Yeah, like bloody tiger, am I right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I never really had any trouble with tiger, but. My Virgin flight got can, um, uh, delayed recently, so I mean, you know, just. And yeah, that's what. supposed to be a full service aircraft. That was carrier. when I was flying business class, too. Oh, what? They what? can't delay business. And they still didn't take off on time for me. You've you got... flew business class? I told you that, didn't I? I got a free business class flight. What? Well, our flights to Sydney for New Year's were horrendously expensive, like 300 bucks each just with Tiger. And I had all these Virgin points from Roadshow, which are flights I don't pay for. Oh, how'd you do that? What do you mean? How'd you get points for that? You, I, I put my card in. When you... Yeah. We should talk about this off the show. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. We did not have much time left. At at 4pm, the Hindenburg arrived over Lakehurst, but where it was supposed to land, but the weather was still anything but ideal for the landing. Commander Proust decided to take the ship southeast to get away from the weather and returned after a detour. Went inland, came back. At 6.12, the airship received a message from the ground crew saying, conditions now considered suitable for landing. 11 minutes later, an even stronger message uh, followed that said, recommend landing now. At 7 p.m., at an altitude of 650 feet or 200 metres, the Hindenburg made its final approach to the Lakehurst Naval Air Station. They decided, they decided to employ a high landing known as a flying moor because the airship would drop its landing ropes and mooring cable at a high altitude and then it would be winched down to the... to the Wenched. Wenched down <laughs> Jess to the brings it mass. down. So they kind of... Re- I always bring it down. <laughs> Basically, they, they reel it in like a giant fish on a... Yeah. Fishing hook. Uh, this type of landing manoeuvre would reduce the number of ground crewmen, but it would require more time. Although the high landing was common procedure for American airships, the Hindenburg had only performed this manoeuvre a few times in 1936 while landing in Lakehurst. So Uh-oh. it's not like a super a thing that they normally do. Yep. Not, not like, you know, standard protocol. Everything seemed to be going, going okay. And at 7.21, while the Hindenburg was at an altitude of 90 metres, 295 feet, the mooring lines were dropped from the bow. The starboard line was dropped first, followed by the port line. So they've dropped their ropes and they're starting to be wenched in. And because everything was going fine at this point, passengers were preparing to disembark, but suddenly, in the control car, the crew felt a big jolt. Uh Uh-oh. One of the crew members yelled out, The ship's on fire! Why? Because the ship was on fire. Ah. Shit. (laughs) Good observation, then. (laughs) It's good. Flames were visible towards the back of the ship. Then within seconds, they spread to the hydrogen gas bags, and then it was only a matter of seconds. (laughs) I forgot, I forgot, so Sorry. Uh, and then it was only a matter of seconds before the whole of the aircraft was engulfed in a mass of flame. How? Smoke the gas. Ah. 
But remember, it was on fire. Yeah, but how did the fire start? Oh, well, we'll talk about that. Smoke billowed hundreds of feet into the sky. As the hydrogen in the rear of the ship burned, the rear of the hydrogen lost its lift and it fell to the ground and its nose pointed upwards at a 45-degree uh, angle. Oh, dear. Kind of, you know how, like, the, the Titanic goes split yeah. in half? And go, it kind of looks like that at first. It goes up and then it crashes back down. Shit. Uh, the front of the ship lifted up over 100 metres into the air. Oh. The fire spread unfathomably quickly and in just a matter of seconds, the entire Hindenburg was completely engulfed in flames. Then the airship fell from the sky and crashed into the ground. In just 34 seconds from when the flames were first noticed, the whole Hindenburg was completely engulfed and smashed all over the ground. Shit. So quick. And at this point, even though the hydrogen had finished burning, it only takes a few seconds for it all to go, Phew! the Hindenburg's diesel fuel burned for several more hours on the ground, so the ground is still on fire. Whoa. Now, what happened to the passengers on board? Oh, I can't imagine... Much yeah. good. Well, the Derner family, we'll start with them. Werner Derner. With the flames just seconds away, the mother of the Derner family, Matilda, tried to encourage our family to jump onto the ground, which at that point was 90 nine. metres. No, so it, she waited till it sank back down and it was only a nine metre drop, which is still great. You could die from right. that. Yeah. But her daughter, Irina, was paralysed with fear and despite her mum's pleas, she wouldn't jump. Ugh. She just stood there frozen. Matilda grabbed her eight year old son, Werner Derner. Tried to throw him through a window, but he fell back into the cabin. Oh, oh my God. Shit. Somehow she pulled us up together, got enough strength. She grabbed him again. On a second attempt, she threw him through the window. Oh, what a and legend. It, and her other son, Walter, also fell through. <sighs> Matilda tried again to encourage Irina to follow her brothers, but instead she turned back into the ship towards the flames to look for her father. This is Irina. So Matilda, having lost her daughter, decided to jump to and followed her sons out. Oh, man. Matilda and her eight-year-old son, Werner Derner, were very badly injured from the disaster, but they made it clear. Oh. Their father, however, is not so lucky. He never made it out. Irina was rescued by a crew member, but not before it being extremely injured, and she died later from those injuries. What about Walter? Walter also lived. Ah. And as of May 2017, when he gave an interview to The Independent, Werner Derner, then eight years old, is now alive at 88 and is the last surviving passenger who was on board. Werner Derner, you old fox. What a legend. Wow. Which is amazing. Um, some other people I mentioned before, Joseph Spar, Ben Dover, the acrobat. Well, his, uh, if anyone was a chance. It was leap. the acrobat. Yeah, yeah his acting, uh, well, his ac- acrobat skills came in handy, and he jumped nine metres to the ground below. And, uh, he injures his foot slightly, but not so much. Uh, because he's a, an acrobat, he's able to run away. So he tumbles and he runs. Knows, he knows how to fall. Yeah. He knows. Sadly, the pet dog didn't make it. Oh. Uh, Rudolf Anders, who's our rich tea man, uh, sadly he didn't make it out. He died in the wreckage. Captain Max Pruce, he did go down with the ship, as they say a uh, captain often should, but when it got to the ground, he jumped out. Right. He Wait, was, got to the ground and he jumped out. Yeah, so he's because uh, he's in the- He's the, lower. He's lower. Hit the ground. He jumps out. He was badly burnt, like extremely badly burnt, but he still hung around to help search for survivors, and he carried an extremely injured radio officer, Willie Speck, out of the wreckage. Willie Speck, that's a good name. Willie yeah. Speck, respect, sadly later died. But the captain pulled through. Uh, but because of his severe burns, he had to undergo several surgeries, and he would later wear a prosthetic nose for the rest of his life. Shit. Uh, one of the cr- young crew members, Werner Franz, he was only 14 years old. He was walking on the lower deck's walkway when the disaster happened. He heard a huge bang and instantly knew something terrible was going on. Trying to find a way out, he tripped over and fell. He grabbed onto a rope and just hung on for dear life. His life, he said, flashed before his eyes like it was a film. A water ballast tank above him ruptured in the chaos and fortunately soaked the boy from head to toe, which snapped him out of this daze that he was in. Which And he went, I've got to get out of here. I've got to survive. And also kept the flames and heat away from where he was. So this water just happened like a miracle to explode above him so he didn't get singed. He eventually kicked his way through the outer canvas of the ship and jumped out of a hole he'd created. It was a drop of five metres. He hit the ground and just started running. Wow. Incredibly, he wasn't injured. Wow, five metres. Yeah. Must be soft ground they're landing on. So where... Whereabouts? So it's a, a naval base. Right. I think it's sort of a grass, big grass area. Right. He'd been given a watch by his grandfather and was allowed to go back to the wreck the next day to search for it. 
and incredibly, he found it. Oh, Get my God. Fucked. Isn't that amazing? Someone's looking after him. Yeah. yeah. He had an interesting life. Later on in life, he became an ice and roller skate coach. Huh. Some of his pupils included Olympic silver medalist Marika Killis and her partner Franz Ningel. He died in 2014 at the age of 92, and he was the last surviving member of the Hindenburg's crew. Right. That's incredible. Imagine if that happened to me, I would have found God in a big way. I reckon I would have become a priest. Yeah. Yeah. Just like there's it's like there's, this is a miracle for Something sure. Something I would have bought a bloody Tatsalotti ticket, I'll tell you that, mate. <laughs> yeah? Yeah, that day. <laughs> what? <laughs> what he would have spent a couple of dollars on a ticket. Would have spent a couple of dollars on a ticket. Well, well, I've dedicated my life to the bloody cloth. No, nah, I would have won a million dollars. Well, the crazy days. thing is that his grandfather actually bought him a lottery ticket and he went back the next day to look for it. <laughs> he did not find it. It was burnt. <laughs> horribly, horribly oh, burnt. Oh, fuck. Should have kept it in the watch. Oh, the it. humanity. <laughs> well, I'm up to that section of the report. The Hindenburg crash is so well documented because many news crews were there to see the this exciting of landing course. of the world's largest ship. Heavy publicity about the first transatlantic passenger flight of the year, because the first one of the season, by the Zeppelin to the US, attracted a large number of journalists to the landing. So you can go online now and you can watch footage of it, and it is harrowing, even though it's in black and white. I'm going to watch it uh, all as the- I go to sleep tonight. Oh, well, That seems like a weird decision. Yeah. Well, good luck to you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you know. I'll call you. Yay! Oh, this was a horrible choice. I can't sleep. All in all, of the 97 people on board, only 35 died. Wow. That is that is surprising. That's surprising. But, although many were severely burned, which is not Oh, it's surprising. not ideal. And uh, one more person on the ground lost their life, which is obviously terrible. But when you watch the video of the disaster, like I was just talking about, you can online, you'd be looking at that thinking, no one's getting out of there. Yeah. It's 34 seconds between flames and burning wow, mass. Wow, right. That's- Incredible. It's no like even if you because you, you can watch it in real time and you're like, all right, uh, you've got like, time to realize what's going on, mm. formulate a plan, and get out. So it hit the ground and then flew up into the sky again. Is that no, right? So what happened was the back went down, so it went up in a ninety degree angle, and then it all just like you, right. like I was talking about a blimp at the start of the episode. You take the air out, it just sort of goes mm. right, but it's just flames everywhere. So the people nine meters up, that was just the. Basically jumping out from the, from the bottom the bottom of the balloon. Yep. Because the thing underneath is about nine metres tall or something. I oh, know. It's just that at that point that's where it was. Right. Eventually it just went. It, in the end it did kind of depend where you were if you survived. Right. Yeah. There were whole sections where people were like just had no hope because they're at the, you know, I guess towards the back or there's no, yep. no windows. Someone was talking about one of the doors jammed or something, which oh. is so awful. Anyway. Um, but um, so you'd be thinking if you're watching it, no one's going to get out, which is exactly what 31-year-old radio journalist Herbert Morrison thought as he watched on. Morrison is very famous with the line synonymous with the incident, oh, the humanity, he's, oh. he's that guy. Morrison was on the scene to record the arrival of the Hindenburg for the WLS in Chicago. It's a radio station. But what I never realised is that he wasn't broadcasting live. His uh, emotional account, uh, which would be heard in Chicago later that night, wasn't broadcast nationwide until the following day. Hmm. But these days, it, if you watch it back, because people have just sync it up with the footage, it looks like he's commentating live. But it was completely separate. And what he, he says is he starts, it starts out very normal, just talking about it. It's practically standing still now. They've dropped ropes out of the nose of the ship and it's been taken a hold of on the field by a number of men. It's starting to rain again. The rain had slacked up a little bit. The back motors of the ship are just holding it, just enough to keep it from... It's burst into flames. It's fire and it's crashing. It's crashing terrible. Oh, my. Get out of the way, please. It's burning, bursting into flames, and it's falling on the mooring mast, and all the folks agree that this is terrible. This is the worst of the worst catastrophes in the world. There's smoke and there's flames now, and the frame is crashing to the ground, not quite to the mooring mast. Oh, the humanity, and all the passengers are screaming around here. So that's his most famous line there at the end. He did, uh, however, take a second to calm. He actually says, ladies and gentlemen, I've got to go inside just to get a hold of myself. And uh, he went on to calmly record another 30 minutes of narration of the unfolding events. But, you know, it's less famous. His voice, which is very high pitch on the recording, I didn't realise this, was actually much deeper. But it all sound- the helium. <laughs> <laughs> Either that or it sounded higher pitch because um, uh, there was a playback error. Right. Like the the speed of how fast he was talking, so it makes him sound like oh the humanity, but really he's like oh the humanity, right? Yeah, oh 
the humanity. I suppose we could just get Matt to do it in his normal Shakespeare. voice. Yeah, Matt, say it. <laughs> oh, the humanity. Yeah, a fun fact, we actually speed Matt up when we uh, play yeah, that. It's been an error all <laughs> yeah. along. It's the only way to make him bloody, you know, understand. Do, it, do they know what, how it happened? What caused the fire? So I hear you asking what caused the fire and then the crash. Next line of my report. This is good. God, we're so in sync. So in sync. <laughs> While there have been many theories over the years, Matthew. Dog. Mole people. Mole people. Dog. Any of the people that I can. Gun, somebody, lighting, somebody lighting their farts. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Check Verna Derna the burner. <laughs> Verna Derna the fart burner. <laughs> Verna Derna the blimp burner. <laughs> No, Which should have given it away. And I know this wasn't a blimp, no, but just, he had form. It was just a terrible coincidence. In the days after the disaster, an official board of inquiry was set up at Lakehurst, the naval base, to investigate the cause of the fire. Their conclusion was that static electricity had started the fire. And this remains a popular theory. Okay. they just flown through a storm. You know, static electricity builds up in the air. You've only got to get a tiny little spark and then... A thing filled with flammable gas is going to go up. Oh, my gosh. Uh, in 2013, a team led by British aeronautical engineer Jem Stansfield and based at the Southwest Research Institute in the US, they came to this conclusion, that the airship had become charged with static as a result of an electrical storm. As I was saying, a broken wire or sticking gas valve leaked hydrogen into the ventilation shafts. And when ground crew members ran to take the landing ropes, they effectively earthed the ship Oh. Now it's got a line to the ground. The fire appeared on the tail of the airship, igniting this oh. hydrogen coming out the back, and then the rest, as I say, is so it's like a perfect storm, mm. sort of. Yeah, mm. literally a storm. So the yeah. So if it was, if they landed in it, would what was the other way they would have landed um, without those ropes? It would always rather than a rope. high one. I think you, they can very uh, they can slowly just descend, right, by dropping ballast and all kinds oh, of stuff. Shit. Mm. Other theories are a bomb, because the Hindenburg was a powerful Nazi symbol, was it brought down from within? Of course, this is an, of course, this is an exciting option, but not many people seem to give it its plausibility actually much credit. Right. I will say that. Yeah. It sounds like a great movie. Mm. Mm. Uh, the other front runner for theory is the IPT, the incendiary paint theory, which was proposed in 1996 by retired NASA scientist Addison Bain. Here's the Addison area. Bain. I yeah. know, what a name. Yes. Name. Give it to me. <laughs> one time, Addison Bain. <laughs> Two time. <laughs> Addison Bain, Addison Bain. A one time. Addison Bain. I love this guy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, his theory, the IP th- IPG theory, is that it had nothing to do with the hydrogen because the outside burned. He claimed it was caused by electrical ignition of Caught lacquer. by. <laughs> Addison Bain. <laughs> His claim was that it was caused by electrical ignition of lacquer and metal-based paints used on the outer hull of the ship. His theory was that somehow the paint on the outside acted, has the, it's got the same ingredients as rocket fuel. So his theory was that the paint caught fire. Sure. But a lot of people are like, mate, what are you talking about? It's clearly the flammable gas. Right. Uh, other hypotheses include the airship being ignited by lightning, or a fuel leak in the gasoline engines catching fire. But leaking gas sparked by some sort of static electricity has definitely been the front runner for 80 years now. The most common theory as to how the gas leak was when the ship sharply turned to dock because it had to do a quick little 180. A brace wire inside may have come loose and ripped a hole in one of the hydrogen airbags. Gas I re- bags. Sorry, one of the gas bags. <laughs> <laughs> I read that they have... Uh, They gave the the hydrogen a garlic smell so that they would smell a leak if they ever had one. And no one, no one smelt garlic, which is the biggest flaw in the theory. It would have. I wouldn't like if I smelt garlic, I'd be like, "Mm, dinner. Like I love garlic. You want to make it. That's why you got to make it smell like farts. Yes, and And I'd be like, oh, who farted? Oh no. Oh no, Verna. Verna, fart (laughs) Verna. Uh, the counter argument to that, the garlic, the garlic floor, is that it would only have been detectable in that area of the leak. So unless you're standing right in that garlicky section, you're not going to get a whiff. You know what I'm saying? Once the fire was underway, more powerful smells like burning would have masked the garlicky odor. <laughs> Opponents of this theory 
Note that the fire was reported was reported as burning bright red, while pure hydrogen burns blue, if visible at all. Although there were many other materials that were consumed by the fire, which could have changed the color. It wasn't just a hydrogen fire. There was a lot of other shit on fire. Change the color of your change the color of your day. Hey hey, crunchy. Hey. Is that the crunchy jingle? Oh yeah. Basically, what I'm trying to say here, Matt, it could be one of those things that we never know for sure. That's right. This episode has secretly been a mystery the whole time. You son of a bitch. You son of a you gun. Absolute you did it. son of a bitch. Suck it in over an hour in. You. I sucked it in. I went stuck it in. You sucked it in. You sucked it in, mate. Um, not surprisingly. Suck it up. Suck it in. <laughs> That's not quite right. Not quite right. I enjoy it. That's better, though. Not surprisingly, the well-documented and widely broadcast Hindenburg crash ended the airship era. Interesting. The disaster probably, in reality, though, fastened the inevitable because airships were quickly becoming obsolete by advances in aeroplanes that were now faster, cheaper, and becoming more and more reliable every single day. Mm. Even at that stage. Yeah. So it's amazing, though. Yeah. It just seemed fascinating that they were still... I guess the Zeppelins were... They didn't see it coming. They never saw it coming. Germany grounded its fleet of hydrogen-filled airships after the disaster, but were never able to replace them as the USA was the only country with substantial helium resources. Mm. Uh, The uh, framework of the Hindenburg was salvaged and shipped back to Germany. There, the scrap was recycled and used in construction of military aircraft for the Luftwaffe, as were frames of the Graf Zeppelin and Graf Zeppelin II, when they were also scrapped in 1940. Mm. From then on, that was kind of it for Zeppelins. And a fun fact to finish. Well, we'll see. We'll Led, see. Led Zeppelin. Mm-hmm. Apparently, the band's name was Corn. Corn, really? <laughs> <laughs> oh, fucking hell! <laughs> I'm so close to the end. Apparently, the band's name was Coined. I mean to say, yeah. Originally, their name was Corn. K O backwards R N. <laughs> but obviously, Jonathan Davis. Yeah, Jonathan got there. He, he was like, first. oh manana, oh manana, oh. Ah. Remember, remember Freak on a Leash? For some reason, he started like making noises for some reason. Yeah. A bit of, he was scatting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, the band's name Led Zeppelin we're back on was coined by the, the uh, crazy drummer of The Who, Keith Moon. When Moon heard about this new band, who were originally called the New Yardbirds, named after Jimmy Page's old band, The Yardbirds, Moon said the band would go over like a Led Zeppelin. Like a Zeppelin made of lead, so... I get it. So I'm just explaining, so it would suck. But the band actually liked the name and ch- and, the, and uh, they liked the challenge and went on to be one of the greatest rock and roll bands ever. So cop that, Keith Moon, you dead bastard. Ah! Nice one. And Led Zeppelin's <laughs> debut album cover is a photo of the Hindenburg crashing. That is right. That's radical. And that is my report on the Hindenburg Disaster. Well done, Dave. Well done. Well done, David. Very good report, David. Werner Bedona would be very proud of you. Thank you, Werner. Uh, that was, oh, yes. Mm. Very much. Hey, Dave, what a great fun time we've had here today. Thank you. We don't have a lot of time left in the in the uh, soundproof booth here, um, which isn't all that soundproof. So basically all we got to do is now say thank you for listening to this episode. If you loved it, we don't say this often, but give us a sweet review. That'd be great. We don't, we don't say, say it, often. it often. Only every few weeks or so. I just can't, I don't think we've said it this year. So I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. Oh, mate. All right. Yeah. So let's thank some people. Yeah. And, but, and we got to thank the out. people that support us at Patreon, patreon.com slash do go on pod. If you want to give back to the pod, we will take your money. Thank you. I we think know, what- well, we really appreciate Don't make it sound gross, Dave. We really appreciate your support. It does help us uh, be able to dedicate time and uh, brain space to yeah, this, this is my fun longest show, which ever. we love doing, of course. We love it. But this was my longest report ever. I would have spent over a day's work on it. I have an idea because you know how we have Werner Derner, the fart burner. I think we should give everybody uh, some sort of a rhyming last name. Yes. Okay, great. Who do you want to thank first there, Jazzy P? Jazzy P. <laughs> you've already. never called me that before and I fucking love it. Okay, great. Um, oh, good. I didn't know what that was going on. <laughs> I would like to thank from Ashburn. Is VA Virginia? Hell yeah. Ashburn, Virginia. Joseph Barshop. Oh, Barshop. Barshop. Wow, that's a great name. Joseph Barshop, the... The Sprightly Bellhop. No, that doesn't quite rhyme, does the, it? Oh, that's good. That's pretty good. The local bus stop. <laughs> Ow. <laughs> 
hit my knee immediately after I said that, so it's karma. Chris will bash up the cars mop. Cars mop is probably the best. He mops the cars. Cars mop. Yeah, none of them quite. It's not a satisfying rhyme. Look, I didn't give us an easy, easy thing to do, did I? But that was fun. I'm that gonna, was fun. I'm going to vote cars mop. Thank you so All much. All right, cars mop. Joseph, we appreciate you, cars mop. And I'd also like to thank from Suffolk, no, in GB, Lee Banks. Ah. Lee Banks. Jesus. The town wanks. The town, a whole town. <laughs> what whole about town whilst wanks. Lee Banks, the town wanks? <laughs> whilst Lee Banks. <laughs> I so love it. when he's there, he's like, while I'm, I'm going to do a quick deposit. But while I'm in here, you guys just keep your hands above your belt line, please. All right. I'm going. I'm going to be home. It's going to be five minutes. You better not be out there he doing does, anything crazy. Well, he does it a quick deposit. What, is he shitting in the bank? <laughs> while everyone else is wanking that side. No, it's sperm money. Bank. It's a sperm bank. <laughs> sperm bank. He's quick, also quick wanking. <laughs> well, I wank you all wank, so I don't feel weird. <laughs> Would I? Oh, thanks, like, thanks, Lee. Lee, well, Lee Banks, <laughs> the town wanks, the town of Suffolk. Uh, I'd love to thank from Cambridge in England, uh, that great university city. I guess is it? Yeah, I'm sure it is. Just looks at me like the fuck do I know? <laughs> sort of hand and face gesture said. Correct. Uh, I'd love to thank with another fantastic name. This whole episode has been full of great names. Dom Benatar. Benatar, the oh, I had something, I lost it. Racing car, the tennis star, oh, the, the cool guitar, <laughs> <laughs> tennis star, I reckon. Dom Benatar, the tennis star. Yeah, I like that. Uh, <laughs> Look at his face. I'm just trying, <laughs> trying but I think I think I've peaked. I'm so sorry, Dom. <laughs> Look at his dumb face. And I'd also love to thank from Louisville, Kentucky, Drew Johnson. Swan song. I thought we were doing rhymes. I tried. <laughs> <laughs> you do one then, fuckhead. <laughs> Got wrong with John- some- Johnson? It's his surname, yeah. J- the Pierce Brosnan. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. True Johnson, the Pierce Brosnan. <laughs> it's just another name. <laughs> that doesn't work, but it might be our best option. <laughs> I wish you could see their faces right now. It's just like it's like we're trying to crack some. I don't. You can't top Pierce mi- Brosnan. Military code. Drew Johnson, the cool. <laughs> no, you fucked it already. We don't have much time. All right, I'll just keep give going. me Pierce Brosnan. Pierce Brosnan. Oh, great. sorry, Pierce, Pierce Brosnan's great. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll do. I'll do my uh, my couple as well, and then uh, if you want to come back to it, you can. Yeah, go on. <laughs> I would like to thank um, from Sheffield in South Yorkshire. Mr. Sheffield. Cheer. Miss Fine. <laughs> Gurge Jeter. Gurge Jeter. The card the, cheater. The cur- that's good. The curd eater. Oh, curd eater. I was going to go the fight streeter. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go with fight streeter. Gurge Jeter, the fight streeter. I love it. Gurge Jeter is a sick name. Yeah. That's what about, great. What about the purge beater? Oh, purge, that's he good. beats the purge. Yeah, he beats the purge. Purge cheater, purge beater. Fuck the purge. Gotta beat the purge. Fuck the purge. Pardon? Fuck the purge. Fuck the purge, Gurge. <laughs> I'd like to thank, also, finally, from Wellington, New Zealand, a place we'd love to visit one day. We'd really love the Windy City. Love to. Beautiful spot. Saints played the first game stop. for points. No, stop it. In, Matt, uh, we on don't international have... soil Matt. in Wellington. Well, you interrupting is not making it faster. Well, we have I was no going to say, I would have already finished this very short fact. The Saints played the first ever AFL game for premiership points in Wellington. <laughs> just, let you, just let you think about how great that fact is. It's a great fact. First from, ever. From Wellington. It took over 100 years before they did it. I would like to thank the Saints. And I'd like to thank New Zealand for hosting them. But for, and I'd also like to thank from New Zealand, Mike Shirley. Mike Shirley. Mike Shirley, whose hair is curly. Mike Shirley, the... Big and baton burly. Baton twirly. Big and burly's good. Spike Surly. No. <laughs> Your face said no as soon as you said it. You knew you'd fucked up. 
This has been the worst of these games. What was the one you said, Matt? We'll go with that. I can't, I can't remember. Big and Surly. Big and Surly. Mark Surly. The Big and Surly. Mark Shirley, the Big and Surly. Yep. There we go. Nailed Thanks it. so much to all those people. Did you love that? I'm sure you did. <laughs> we appreciate that. <laughs> we appreciate all of you. Um, do you love us? We're sure you do. We do. And Mike. <laughs> I, was there, I was pretending to be them. <laughs> Mike, if you were at the uh, Saints game, I was there, the first ever. Uh, AFL game played. Oh, I assume this points. was in like the 1930s. No, no, this is in 2013 uh, or something, 14. Somehow that made that less interesting <laughs> and I just didn't think it could. <laughs> it's in the cake tin, I believe the place is called. It was just a sick place, beautiful spot. We'd loved love, it. We'll do a pod live from the cake loved tin. Loved Wellington. Wellington. And we love everyone that listens over in New Zealand. Hello. Thank you so much. And uh, everyone that listens throughout the world, if you want to get in contact, our uh, dis- everything in the description of this episode, do go on pod at gmail.com. And all the social medias are at do go on pod. We would love to hear from you. But until next week, we'll say thanks so much for listening. And I'll say goodbye. Later. Bye. This podcast is part of the Planet Broadcasting Network. Visit planetbroadcasting.com for more podcasts from our great mates. It's not optional. You have to do it. <laughs> we used to go easy on it, but now you have to. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, the humanity. <laughs>